Hi everyone, I'm Nadia from Women in Animation, uh, currently Vice President of our um, organization at Academy of Art University, welcome. Hi there, I'm Laura Vitolino. I'm the current president for our student chapter. Um, yeah, and so Nadia and I will be kind of leading through the uh, talk with our panelists today. Um, we're hosting Shoulder Height Films, um, yeah. Nadia, do you wanna do a little intro? intro? Yeah, so we have Annika Schonefeld from <laughs> Shoulder Heights. So, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. I practiced, I did. <laughs> and we also have uh, Chris Hi. Schreier. Hi. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I will let them um, take on the rain right now. I know they have a little introduction video, so we're going to watch that first uh, whenever you're ready. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, Annika Schoenefeld. Um, yeah, I have one of those names. Um, I'm the founder and creative director at Shoulder Height Films. Um, and I'm here with Chris Schreier, um, who is my producer um, in animation and longtime friend. Um, so, hello. Um, yeah, so we are, uh, let's just get into it. So we are Shoulder Height Films. Um, we are a brand new animation studio up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but Portland, Oregon is the hub in the entire world. It is the largest hub for stop motion animation. Um, and by proxy, we actually get quite a good hub of other types of animation because every stop motion feature will have their CG department. We will have, you know, so we have a range of really great animation happening in the Pacific Northwest up here. Um, Chris and I specifically moved up here to work within stop motion animation. Um, those shoulder height films, we've done CG, we've done 2D. Um, stop motion is our passion um, and handmade animation is um, just a really exciting um, field within animation to be involved in right now. Um, yeah, so we, we primarily focus on commercials. We put together a short video, I promise, uh, just a minute of a little bit about our work and some things that we do and have done. Um, so you guys can kind of get a gauge on that before we get into our other topics. Please accept this tasty spam meal as a token of my appreciation. <coughs> Find new spam meals for one in a microwavable meals aisle. Break the monotony. This is Mission Control. We're a go for breakfast. Roger that. Ignition and lift off. We're currently passing by hearts, stars and horseshoes, clovers and blue moons, unicorns, rainbows and tasty red balloons, and whoa, orange planets, red planets, and blue rocket ships. We've never seen those before. They look galactically delicious. New limited edition Galactic Lucky Charm. Linda's little nose was in a standoff with regular tissues, so she roped in Puffs Ultra Soft to ease her issues. Puffs are air fluffed with 40% more cushiony thickness to relieve. A nose in need deserves Puffs indeed. Yeah, so those are just a couple of things. The last two we just did this year, but the first one I wanted to share with you guys, that was my first national commercial as a director. It was a big break for me. It was so exciting. Um, that shot of a fork going into a bunch of spam and potatoes, that's all I did. That's all I did, but that was my big break. That was my big moment. And I just wanted to share that with you guys because that was 12 years ago. Um, and sometimes your big moments start really, really small. Um, so uh, that commercial was done by House Special. Um, which was at the time like a house, which is here in Portland. I was based in New York City and I had my first job as a director. Um, I was a staff director for an animatics company. Um, so we did tests for commercials. So it was like kind of lower quality animation because it wasn't going to go into broadcast. It was so that they could like kind of work out all their ideas and their timing on commercials as an agency prior to going into making the commercials. Um, Traditionally, that's uh, it's a 
a churn and burn, those kind of companies where you'll get a job, but you're going to work 20 hours a day. Sometimes you're just going to like work, 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 but you'll get a lot of experience. And through that job, I just, I learned 2D animation, 3D animation. I got to work with lots of different things, but I also did some special effects and live action shooting. And that's how they were like, oh, you can shoot food here, shoot spam. Uh, and so that was, that was my first commercial. Um, and I'm still really proud of it because it's in a museum. Spam has its own museum. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that was the beginning of it all. Um, I went through a lot of live action work after that before finally coming back into animation. So um, uh, three years ago, uh, I started pursuing stop motion animation more specifically with my career, um, which led me here to Portland where I met Chris um, and we both worked at Leica on one of their feature films. Um, before leaving that to work together at Bent Image Lab, another uh, commercial company here in Portland, where we did both the Galactic Lucky Charms and the Puffs commercial um, before starting our own company, which is a fully female owned and run uh, production company, Shoulder Height Films, um, which we've named it such because we rise by lifting each other up. You know, and it's it's not always about how high we get sometimes. It's also how high can our shoulders go so that we can bring on the next people. Um, and that is kind of the up till now. Oh, we have a, a few questions rolling in um, into the chat. If you wanted to go ahead and answer from Melissa, we have from your point of view, how has the animation industry changed since the COVID-19 pandemic hit? Hugely. Um, animation, a lot of live action films had to stop production completely with COVID. Um, and places like Netflix, places like these studios that their main source of income, the theaters were closed, they couldn't put out movies. You know, we were just talking about a trailer for a movie we've been watching for two years, but the theaters were closed, they still haven't released. Um, so suddenly animation was one of the few areas where films could keep making things, they could keep working. So now where you live is less important. Um, everybody's working from home. So on our last production, um, I think we had three time zones worth of people uh, involved in our production and um, very, very few of them were local to us. So our animator was in LA, our lighting guy was in Iowa. Yeah, Iowa, um, Chris is nodding for me. Um, We've had uh, our texture artist was here in Portland with us, you know, so we really spread that out. And so working virtually, that's one of the big differences. It gives you a lot more flexibility. It gives you a lot more opportunity. However, if you're getting started in film, you're getting started in animation, I would say one of the hardest things is there's no more learning by proxy. You don't sit next to people and overhear their conversations or see their workflow or have those casual conversations. Um, you're really on your own continuing to learn yourself. So finding mentorship, I think, is even more important. Finding those relationships where you can continue to have casual conversations about your work, your process, like the things that you're working on. You're never going to show up as just an expert in what you're doing um, when you're getting started. So I think that that's one of the hardest things is finding still that camaraderie and that that step-by-step -step conversation that you would have had with someone that was just working next to you in the office. Um, but it leads to a lot more opportunities for you guys. You can kind of live anywhere. And that's something that nobody wants to go back to um, having to live in LA, having to live in New York. Like they want to live where they can have the lifestyle that they want. People want to live in Portland because it's kind of awesome. Um, and so you can work in Portland now. And we have friends in town that are working on feature films down in LA, but they get to live up here. Um, so that's one of the big shifts. I would say animation has more work than ever since COVID because people are able to continue working uh, remotely. 
To piggyback off of that, I would say that this is also a time that is really ripe for writers and people who are interested in sharing their own stories because there are so many people at home. Netflix, um, it, for example, accepted like um, over a hundred scripts from unknowns this year. So like people who have absolutely no connections within the industry, just submitting story. And so that's unprecedented. So it's a great time for people to be really working on their personal projects and pursuing them um, to get them on screen in, in a way that I don't think that we've really seen before. Because normally there are these channels where you, you work your way up through crew, you work your way up through production, and then yep. you meet the right person who connects you to the right person. But now that all of that those lines of communication are really changing, it's really opening up a lot of opportunities for people who, like Annika said, are not in LA or who are just, you know, amazing writers who just, um, you know, are just, you know, pursuing and accomplishing um, without having to follow that, like, you know, normative track. So that, that's, for me, as someone who, who is interested in more, more stories, more diverse stories, it's, I think it's really exciting to see that yeah. change. And, um, but I also am a silver linings person. So <laughs> I think also, um, because we're virtual, like a lot of things that we're already becoming industry standards, it's really important that you guys have your portfolios out there. Not just you have a website you have on Behance, you're on art space, or, you know, like there's a list of places where you can have your portfolio. Now, because we're very online based, even in our basic workflow, that's becoming more and more of the normal conversation of like producers coming in the room and be like, oh, I was just on, you know, this portfolio site, found someone, reached out to them about a project. Um, so those things that I think has made it much more rapid that being just online, being available in these spaces is getting you access more. Um, because the world of being just online and us just hunting around the internet is becoming more and more of an everyday thing all the time. Yeah, it's also absolutely, really exciting. It's, as someone who has more of a fabrication background, um, it absolutely has changed the way that we look for builders um, in stop motion, the way that um, builders are, um, you know, presenting their work. Um, more than ever it's about you know like documentation where before you still like build something beautiful take a couple of really lovely shots but now it's all progress work it's all like what are you working on now how are you continuing to to work you know um given all of these current obstacles um so it's it is really shifting the um like Annika said like the online space is really becoming a place where like we all like inhabit to find and look for work and you know put our, yeah. put our own work out there I see like I don't know I don't have the chat open this is too distracting oh, okay, we, I, I have it open um, you. but uh the I, I see like like where can we be posting where you know are these like little clippets mm -hmm. of the beginning of the questions and um uh and that's a really good and important conversation you guys should continue to have and continue to ask like what are these things um, but I would definitely say just the really big ones, the big portfolio sites is you should have an Instagram that is just your work. It is not your personal life. It is not any of those things. Just keep putting your work out there. Give people a place. That's just a, an easy one. Um, but also like, I like Behance, I think Chris and, um, Anthony and some of our other producers have liked some other sites, um, a lot more. I let them do a lot of the hunting and bring them to me bring them to me but Chris is a little bit more of the like proactive hunter um on these things Chris do you have a set couple sites that you like um I do I'm terrible with nouns so I can throw them in the chat later um but uh, honestly for me as a producer and I kind of want to hit on out Annie asked about like the role of a producer in animation how you talk to directors and clients of the other stuff a huge part of what I do as a producer is that I am looking for talent I'm looking for people and it is constantly changing what I need. Um, we work in commercial. And so what we are doing is constantly changing, which means I'm needing different people. The people who are routinely contacting me are the most likely for me to reach back out to. Um, whether it's just like, hey, I contacted you last month. I just wanted to show you this new thing that I've worked on. Hope everything's going great. Staying at the top of my inbox 
Like that's gold. And for me, when I was first starting out, when I was first looking for jobs, that is how I got jobs. It's just, I had a spreadsheet of everyone in LA who was making stop motion and who was their contact person and sending them an update email every month and letting them know that it updated my resume, that I loved the current thing that they were working on. Um, and that has been a huge part. I think kind of where you put your work, um, it is less important than who are you reaching out to. Yeah, agreed. And reaching out in good, proactive ways. So Chris passively just casually mentioned some things that I really want to highlight to you guys. Um, what are you guys doing right now that I love so much, right? You're not writing a spam email. You're like, you wrote to her because of what she's doing. And really in a non annoying way, like, hey, just hope things are going well, putting a little update, but like, you don't want to be annoying because that's like the opposite of what you're going for. Um, but keeping track, like what was Chris working on that made you reach out to Chris or gave you an excuse to reach out to Chris and continue that conversation. Um, so doing that well is, is vital when you're getting started mm -hmm. still. Um, uh, I think that that's a really good point, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I could, I mean, I could talk about that for, for like forever, I feel like. Um, yeah. uh, it's, it has served me so much in my career to reach out to people, um, even though it doesn't always feel great to be like, here I am from the dark. Would you look at my art, please? Um, and sometimes people never do, but sometimes they do. And then they offer you a job. Um, and then when you get a job, you meet really great people. And then that's, you know, people are really a huge part of how you find work, you know? And yeah. so whether, um, it's just connecting with people who are at this same level of experience as you so that you can like talk about like what it is that you're going through or maybe work on projects together or continuing to like follow up with, um, production companies or even like small artists who are making work by themselves. They often need help. Um, yeah. You know, just connecting really with anyone. That's uh, a thing that Annika is amazing at. Annika will talk to everyone and anyone about their process and what they're doing and their current project. And it's really been a huge part of her success. Um, I also would um, highly recommend you guys look into, since we're just getting into it, um, the commercial space. So we at Shoulder High Films, like we are pitching on TV, we are looking at big projects, but commercials is a really vital part of the industry. It gives you quick turnarounds, it gives you projects you could start showing off, and it keeps work coming. So as we're working on a team, it's easier for us to take a new person and put them on a commercial for a week, a month, you know, whatever it is, depending on what position they're in. Um, and get to know them and get to know them as a person, get to know their workflow than it is to just hire someone on to a TV show. That is then we're like, all right, well, I want to be working with you for a year. And I, you know, at that point you have a strong tendency to go with someone with more experience, but to find out that someone's a great worker that you work well with commercials is a really golden part of the industry for you guys to start getting connected with. And as opportunities to get work, opportunities to keep building your portfolio, building your professional network, um, I would definitely, as you apply for those, you know, you want to work at Pixar, apply to Pixar, but as you're doing it, keep track of who's doing commercials, who can you be doing this kind of work with to help build out your portfolio, getting that network and getting that professional work on your reel um, is going to be a really important stage. That was what was great for me. I mean, not everybody has to go to commercials, but it's been really valuable for me, especially because I wanted to become a director. And I'm not, I'm so jealous that you guys are all college students that want to be in animation because I wish in college I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't. I worked in film for a while. I did a lot of different things as I got there. Um, and you have that opportunity. You have that opportunity to be studying the thing you want to be doing. And that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, when you're young and you're moving through, I would say, check out the commercial companies. It's going to be faster turnaround to getting portfolio pieces. Um, I guess we can like pull back and maybe talk about uh, how did you, Annika, get into the live action um, industry? Because you mentioned in our earlier conversations that you actually wanted to go into, you know, becoming a cook and things like that. So yeah. what was your journey? How did you get here? You know, you're, you're 
founding a company now and um, being a creative director. So yeah, how it all started. Um, yeah, so I, when I was in college, I thought I was gonna be a chef. Um, I was studying uh, photography. Honestly, when I was a freshman, I had a triple major. And when I graduated, I had double majors that were not related. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, but I got a very random opportunity um, working in a restaurant. I was nice to this little old lady. This little old lady turned out to be someone's mother who introduced me across. And next thing you know, um, I was working on Hannibal, um, was the first feature film that I worked on as Anthony Hopkins' personal assistant. Um, and it really came through very random channels. Like nobody could follow my path uh, into that, but I, I learned really quickly that if you're proactive and you say like, I'm paying attention, I'm ready, what do you need? How can I help? That I, it very quickly went on to another feature film. Um, in town very quickly went on to getting more work and I didn't want to be a production assistant. So I was like, mm, I see, I see that job. That job looks painful. How do I skip that? And I looked around, I looked around, I was like art department, pretty sure I'd be good at that. And I just jumped into a department as a way of moving forward. I became an art director um, and worked in commercials and feature films as an art director and a set still photographer. I'm um, doing all the marketing and uh uh, marketing uh, set photography for features. Um, I did that for about 10 years and I studied every position. Again, there was, there's a job on a feature on live action work called best boy. And I wanted to do it. I was like, yeah, I'll sign up, make me the best boy on set. I love it. Um, it's in the grip and electric department. I did get to do it for a day. Um, and I just tried every job. I tried every job. I was like, I'll do craft service. I'll feed you your snacks. Like, what do we, need to do to really understand everything about filmmaking. Um, and when it really came down to it and I was like ready to take the next step into, you know, whether it was being a production designer or, uh, you know, a lead role, I was like, I admitted out loud finally that I was like, I think I want to be a director. And I told a good friend who, who was a good mentor to me. I told her and she never let me forget it. She never let me forget that I had a dream that big. And she never left me alone about it either. She's like, so what are you doing? How are you gonna, how are you gonna do that? And something that I found really important was being willing to take apart my life and career up to that point in order to build what I wanted to build. And so I moved from my smaller town. I was in, I mean, I was in Philadelphia. It wasn't a tiny town by any means, but it was a smaller industry as far as the film industry goes. And I left to move to New York to become a director and started over, had to start my network over, had to start all those things over again. And I got to work for that animatics company um, that got me into animation. I did not know animation. I knew I was interested. My brother was a particle effects animator. So I like had all this side knowledge of like conversation, but I didn't really know it until that moment. I love that experience. I shot some spam, spam people, spam. Um, but that that led to getting to shoot some live action food commercials. Um, I had a background as a chef from college, so that was an easy transition for me. And I built the last 10 years of my career. I mean, pre-pandemic 10 years, I guess it's 12 years ago, but you know, but I built the that time doing live action food work. And I flew to Russia to shoot mayonnaise. I mean, I had a really great opportunity to have a lot of adventures, but nobody respected my creative energy. They just wanted me to be a technical director. They liked that I could pull off this very specific kind of work. And I really wanted to be a creative and I really wanted to make work that inspired me that like mattered to people. And, you know, shooting McDonald's commercials is not that fulfilling as an artist. Um, and so I love my work, but it wasn't where I wanted to go. So once again, dismantling a career that was successful. I was in the DGA. I was in the uh, cinematographer's union. I was doing really, really well. And I tore it all apart to come to Portland, Oregon to start in stop motion animation because what I really wanted to do was get back to animation. What I really wanted to pursue was making 
things that mattered to me and um, came to Portland with so blessed to work at Leica. Um, incredible artists there. I met Chris at the time. Chris was in the hair department and making uh, puppet wigs. And I joined in the costume department. So I went from being a director down to making costumes um, in fabrication and had an incredible time, learned a lot and was able to move back now into directing and back into animation in the way that I was hoping to um, and now finally opening the studio of my own. So that's my path. Wow, like truly that. amazing. <laughs> um, on the topic of the studio, we do have a few questions that I've sort of combined. Um, there's a few, does your company have any internship opportunities? And are you looking to hire any remote PA assistants as well? Hi, okay, so getting into that. So Chris and I, um, have, it's a team of four women. Um, we have Hannah and Brooke with us as well. And- I think Brooke um, be on the call, actually. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen Brooke on the call as well. Um, I'm here, I'm just quiet. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> um, and we, we've been building this together. Um, we are a very, very new company. You'll see we have not yet got our website out. We have it being built, but it's not yet public. Um, putting together, we have an Instagram that I'd love for you guys to all check out and follow, um, as well as you can follow us as artists and directors and things, but um, the studio, we have a studio space um, that will be taking on physical space and beginning a renovation, hopefully in the beginning of 2022. Um, at which point, on a per project basis, we definitely are still hiring um, like for an individual commercial. And that's where, again, Chris is looking for a texture artist or a 2D animator or, you know, whatever number of positions, as you guys know, animation is huge in its range. Um, and so we're constantly hiring for projects. We will be implementing an internship program absolutely um, in the studio. Mentorship and interns are a very passionate part of, of the film journey for me. I really care about that stuff. Um, but again, that probably won't start until uh, sometime next year. Um, and we're always open to those conversations. You know, we really want to build a supportive and nurturing environment. Um, and that's something that I did not have much of in my film career. Um, I really want a place where people can grow, people can, you know, develop and get into where they, where they really wanna to get to. Um, so we'll take, we'll, we'll be working on that path. We are definitely looking to do an internship program, a proactive internship program, um, as well as constantly looking for artists for individual projects um, as they go. But yeah, you don't have to live in Portland to work with us by any means. Um, stop motion animation, which is what we're very passionate about, um, that's where you'll find you want to be more local. And that's huge because I was talking to my friend, an editor who worked at Lucasfilms on a Star Wars show. And I was like, cool, I'm looking at breaking down a budget for a similar sized 2D animation TV show. And I was like, how many animators did you have? And she's like, I don't know. It was all done in Korea. So like most animation is outsourced. So that's one of the reasons stop motion is a passion for us is it's all local artists. They are, you know, here with us building things. You can't, I mean, you could ship puppets around, but like people have to make them um, by hand. So um, that is, I'm just a rabbit trailing, sorry. No, no to that point, no, you hit it because someone in the chat asked like, um, so some of the students here are studying stop motion, um, wanna know if it's advisable to relocate to Portland or LA. Um, I really think that that is a personal decision and choice because with the internet, you like absolutely can be found and recognized because of the work that you're putting online and be able to transfer to a city like LA or Portland um, with a job. Um, I moved to LA out of school without a job. Um, and it was hard and scary. And um, I know 
other people who have done it and had to go back home. And I know some people who are freaking rock stars. So it is, you know, moving across the country to LA or Portland. Um, I was a student who put themselves through college. And so it was um, something that I did really all on my own. And so as much as I've gained from it, I'm not, I am not in a rush to tell people that you have to do that because there are sacrifices that come with it. And in this day and age of um, the plethora of opportunities found online, I think that if you have financial constraints that are substantial, um, I think that you can find ways around it and get yourself to LA with a job when you land there. Um, that being said, if you have the hustler spirit and you're not afraid of living off of, you know, 20 pound bags of rice and canned beans and you, you know, you love the pain, go for it. Um, I have a fabrication background myself. Um, I had a lot of fun doing a lot of different types of art and that type and those experiences have absolutely, um, absolutely aided me. I worked in mostly like the toy sector, but, um, so working in, um, uh, toy prototypes as well as national campaigns to sell toys, um, because miniatures are very similar, you know, miniatures are in the realm of what stop motion artists build, but I also worked in scenic houses where I was painting wood grains and faux brick and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and doing things for live action, action sets. Like, honestly, they could not be more different, like making tiny houses for Paw Patrol commercials. And then next week going and getting strapped into a harness and built, you know, painting five story brick facades. You know, like really so many amazing experiences. Um, so really terrible <laughs> experiences. But like, that is just my journey. And I think that, you know, if you have people near you that you can be working with, if you have the drive to build at home, if you have um, an interest in, in curating um, an online, um, like presence, like, I think that's also doable. I mean, there are people on TikTok who are killing it. The stop motion stuff on TikTok is, wah, wah, wah. it's so good. And those kids are going to get picked up. Those kids are going to get jobs. Um, yeah. People get plucked up by studios. Um, so it's, it is not impossible. So, you know, take an inventory. Those decisions are for yourself. Are I do not think, though, that it is a requirement. Um, yeah. But that's just, that's, that's my TED talk. Thank you. I would say, I love it. I would say though, like if you're interested in stop motion animation, you should know where you're trying to network. You know that you're trying to network in Portland. You know, you're trying to network in LA. You know, you're trying to network in Europe. Um, New York has some, but it's a very small group of people in New York doing stop motion, um, which is where I came from, which is part of why I was like, if I open a studio, I want to do it in Portland. Cause that's, there's three feature films going on in Portland right now in stop motion animation, um, which like that's the most stop motion in one city ever, but LA has, you know, still stupid buddies and Bix picks and lots of different studios that do commercials to TV to all kinds of things. So um, you should have that list, like what Chris talked about of these are the studios that I'm trying to get in touch with and who is the person I could start a conversation with? How do I have a conversation with people um, there so that I can be up to date on what's happening, who's making what, what who has projects. Um, especially in the TV and movie sphere, you can find out about these big projects. Um, so you know where you wanna be networked in based on these cities. So you should follow Portland Animation. So know? someone asked me in the chat and I, an I answered them very briefly, but I figure since I've, you know, it's available for everyone. How do you put that list together? It literally is no more like there's no more nuance to it other than like internet sleuthing. It is like Googling uh, studio, stop motion studio, 2D studio, um, 3D studio, creative collectives, um, commercial 
uh, animation, and then your city's name or the city that you're looking in. I would make a spreadsheet for each city um, that you're looking in. Uh, it is really no more nuanced than that. And literally yeah. just going through each website, looking at their stuff, seeing if that's a place that you think you're interested in. I would say if things don't look super polished, they probably need interns. And experience is experienced as is experience, right? So like, yeah. yes, maybe you're an intern at a couple of different studios. Um, if you have the financials to swing that, baby, do it. Um, but it, it's really no more nuanced than just like Google searching and also like digging into the shows that really speak to you, the shows that you really like, the films that you really like, who made them, where were they made? Um, yeah. IMDB, it's you know, it's so much easier than it used to be, you know, but you just track people down. You can yeah. use IMDb and put, look at people's entire career paths. Um, like truly. Yeah. Um, I also, I'll say too, cause so one of the things that we really champion at shoulder height films is, um, being a positive place for neurodiversity and, and had, each of us has different, like, learning techniques and, and work methods and things that we need. And sometimes this idea, this like Google spreadsheet of like things feels overwhelming to some people. And there's a lot, it's the same thing as you start following people on Instagram, chat with them, leave comments, start a discussion. People are people and people like people, generally speaking, and artists put their work out there, leave a compliment, but not just a compliment, something that actually starts in a conversation. I have met some incredible artists, some top of their field. I've met miniaturists that absolutely, their work should just be in museums forever, like unbelievable talents. And they've shared with me techniques. They talk, we talk because they are just people. So starting those conversations, you can, wherever you find talent that you appreciate, it's not a competition. Be friendly with the people whose work you admire the group women in animation, like find the work of the people that you like and just start talking with them. They, you know, so find the channels that will help you break that down. If the spreadsheet version you should still need to plug away at, but if that gets overwhelming, just start hitting up human beings um, in whatever platform is easiest for you. Um, because the world does want you to engage in the conversation. And we so easily separate ourselves from that. We so easily like hide from the conversation and being a part of it, having that voice at the table. Sometimes that literally just means chatting with the other artists, just chat with the other artists. And that'll be the beginning of getting your voice in the industry, getting your voice in the network. I have my art director on the rocket ship spot. Um, we became friends through Instagram. Like he's local to me now and we have, you know, since worked, obviously we've worked together. I like moved and I gave him my barbecue, you know, like we're friends. But I initially through direct messages chatting with him about 3D printers. That's how we became friends. It's and, also how you connected yeah. with our coordinator, Hannah. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, women in animation groups like this are incredibly valuable, but they're not valuable if you just sit back and like say you know you want to say hi you want to connect um for me some of those things I'm a, I'm a big introvert believe it or not and some of those things get really draining for me it gets really exhausting so again break it down into where is it easiest for you to find connection because people like people who like their work like it's a compliment for you to start that conversation so you don't need to be afraid about approaching them some people never look at dms and you'll never hear back that's okay too just leave compliments. If they're posting their work, they're trying to share it with the world, engage with that conversation. Um, yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah, I completely agree with the women in animation. It's a great network and please connect to us and we can connect us to bigger chapters. Um, but bouncing back to kind of selecting the right, either stop motion studio, I wanted to talk about like the hidden dangers of working with these like new plastics and new materials. I know that there's like a whole side yeah. to it. Should probably so <laughs> people interested in stop motion, um, one, this is a really big deal and it doesn't sound like a big deal unless you're in our niche, but um, we are building a green studio. 
Um, we are trying to do a low toxicity um, environment studio. In stop motion animation, we deal a lot of plastics, melting plastics, glues, you know, lots of materials that on their own might not be terribly toxic, um, but with prolonged exposure, with using even something like super glue every day, all the time, it, people have developed chemical sensitivity within the stop motion industry and within fabrication. Um, this is something that affects women uh, even more than men we've noticed um, through just our friend groups and the people affected. And so that has become a priority for us is to build a green studio. But if you're interested in stop motion animation, I do think it is a topic that you should start to educate yourself on. Um, we have um, actually broke Chris and Hannah were all on my safety committee at our previous studio. Um, and, you know, making sure that you do learn like always using your gloves when you, you know, all the, those things. So um, it's a niche industry. Like the nice thing about animation, most the rest of animation, there's no toxicity, you're at a computer. You need to give a break from the screens every once in a while. But um, within stop motion, that is definitely something to be educated on um, is chemical sensitivity because people develop it over the course of their careers. Um, but I've definitely seen it end careers because they can't, they can no longer be near resin, for example. A resin is very, very reactive and you don't know when your body will start reacting to it, but you'll suddenly hit that moment and then you can walk past someone else's restaurant, they're refinishing their floors and you'll break out in a rash because you were like close to somebody using resin. So um, that's something that we care very much about as a studio is creating a safe environment. Um, not to say that other studios are innately not safe, but really taking that to that next level, really, really um, making that a priority. Um, is another reason why we, as a group of four, decided to start our own studio um, and really give it that fresh start is because being a low toxicity environment was really important to us. Um, and it does, it does often require a full fresh start or a full renovation or a full um, bigger step. So um, that's something that we at Shoulder Height Films do care very much about. Yeah, and this is just my, this is like my mom pitch because I, as a fabricator, as a background fabrication, this stuff's really important to me. It's like, always wear gloves, always wear gloves. Anytime I hear someone say, I can't sculpt with gloves on, all I hear is you're not a very good sculptor. Uh, and I know that that sounds real rude, um, but put gloves on. It, it, lifetime exposure to even inert um chemicals is still is still exposure and you're absorbing things through your hands if you can smell it it's in your bloodstream so if it smells bad put a mask on if you can smell it through your mask you haven't put your mask on right and always read the instru yeah. instructions and warnings on everything you're working with um yeah. and that was that was my tough mom talk um yeah. <laughs> And we will say, as this is a women in animation, you know, event, a lot of these health risks factors, like chemical sensitivity can happen to anyone. And we have all genders, friends that have been affected, but a lot of the health risks affect women worse or more or earlier um, for different things. So it, you know, it's something that we should talk about. It's something that we should care about um, as a group. So that's our PSA. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I feel like not enough people talk about, you know, the harmful um, toxins that are in all the tools that go into 3D and stop motion. Um, on that topic, someone asked if you use 3D printers as a part of your creative process um, for stop motion at all. And what are your thoughts on this technology? I love 3D printing. Um, I love hand sculpted things the most because like, it's like magic. You just watch someone and like all of a sudden you're like, oh my, God. like I can't make that. That was how, and it just like magically appears through their talent. Um, but 3D printing we use all the time. Um, at larger studios, you'll see face replacement animation, um, all those things. And that's a, a entire subsect of the digital animation departments at Leica for example, is just people that are going into, all their work is gonna be 3D printed. 
um, whether they're making props, whether they're doing facial animation, whether they're doing, you know, other, you know, internal bits and bobs, but they are CG artists and all their work is meant to be printed. Um, and then there's the CG artists that are doing backgrounds or characters or effects, you know, so if you're interested in that, um, it's definitely a big field and it translates well into live action film. It translates into, um, I worked as a head of fabrication for a specialty prop house in New York where we had a 3D department of 3D printers. Um, I think that there is um, a lot to explore within that. I think it's still a growing field at the level of printing. Some of the worst jobs you can get at a stop motion studio is cleaning 3D prints all day and sanding them and then sealing them. Um, and it's it's called working in the sandbox and it stinks. Um, so, you know, it, it's- That being said, it a, does get you in the door. It does, it does get, get you in the, in the door. door. So yeah. it might stink. Sometimes you do jobs that aren't fun, but they get you in the door. Yeah. Um, for us, we're, um, I've used it for even CG jobs where I'm doing character presentations or pitch decks. So it's not limited to stop motion only. I definitely have seen it on other jobs um, from live action needing something specialty to CG doing a presentation um, or character design, you know, uh, things. I, so I've definitely seen it used across the board. And it's worth knowing how to take your CG animation into print. Because um, a bad print is like really thick and solid and really, you know, done poorly. And it's not a lot of education. If you already know how to sculpt, it's not a huge amount of education to get you into having a print of your sculpt. And I really think it's a unique way to show off your work if you're a CG animator. And that's, you know, you want to go into CG and stay in CG. It's still a unique way of showing off your portfolio, a unique way of showing off the kinds of things you can do. Um, and I've heard once you have your own little printer, it gets addictive and people just start making stuff all the time. Um, so I do think 3D printing is super valuable. Amazing. A lot of people have been sharing that they love that you share that you're an introvert and that you're so successful in everything that you've accomplished throughout your career and not only how far you've come, but they're happy to hear that you're successful in all of it. So it's nice to Introverts hear. can, we can do it guys, we can do it. <laughs> um, I think when you face up, like knowing yourself is a really important life journey, right? We're just on a life journey of getting to know who we are. But, you know, knowing if you're ADD or knowing that you're an introvert or knowing, knowing your obstacles is important because you can overcome them. It's not that I'm not gonna be an introvert, but I know that I need to make more meaningful connections because I can't handle making large group connections, right? I need to do one-on-ones. I need to be getting to know people um, in a more personal way because I don't show up at the party and meet 20 people and stay in touch with them all. I have a really good conversation and I keep that up. Um, and so it's not that you're overcoming it, meaning you stop being whatever that is. It's that you find the way to continue to pursue what you want anyway. And we need each other. We need people. Um, and so you can't just hide away and hope that the world is going to see you. You need to be good to work with. You need to be communicative when you're on a job, being easy to work with things. So as we talked about with COVID, we have, um, we were running um, our studio through F-Track, um, Shotgun. These are all project management softwares. Um, if you worked with the Amazon Nimble Studio, they have their own project management software. But this is a way that you chat with your coworkers, share files, share, show your work, share your work, um, and all these things. And knowing how to be a good communicator within these platforms is the equivalency of like, I still get to work from home. I still get to like have my, space that I need, but I'm showing up and I'm being a part of that conversation. Um, because just because you're an introvert and you need that space doesn't mean that you should be quiet. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be heard. It just means that, you know, you can get drained out by large groups of people. Um, so I think the pandemic has been great for us introverts uh, in the way that we've found ways to give ourselves that room um, but again, I think you just have to keep coming back to how does it that I show up for the conversation? Um, 
and we get to hide away in our own rooms and still show up now. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. So introverts, let's take over the world. Let's go. Um, I wanted to also kind of ask, um, so you're a director and um, you're in this high position and as artists, we're, we're supposed to tell stories and kind of tell certain things and, you know, keep these conversations going. And so besides the commercial work, what is something that maybe your studio or maybe you uh, want to kind of like make the conversation going and, and, you know, be a part of certain topic projects? Is there something specific you, you want to, you know, you know, put up higher? So... Yes. Um, so this is, I'm hugely passionate about this um, because why I'm building a commercial studio. Um, I'm building a commercial branch to my studio is really how I think of it. Even if we start with commercials and that's how we make our money because I need to make money, money is power. And I need to be able to control my studio's trajectory. Um, and so we do commercials um, and I'm, I love advertising and marketing, but um, I'm really, really passionate about um, telling empowering stories uh, to kids. Specifically, um, my, my, the stories I write and we work with other writers, other directors, you know, people like we care about lifting people up in general. But for me personally, as a director, um, that angry eighth grade girl that really wishes the world would take her more seriously is my muse. Like that is who I wanna make content for. I love my inner eighth grader who desperately wanted to be taken seriously and the world still treated me like a kid. Um, and making content for kids that are dealing with more complex issues than I was, you know, I'm older than I look. Like I was, you know, my childhood was in the eighties. I was barely allowed to watch TV, much less um, have the internet. There was no social media. There was none of those things. So um, I'm actually working on a, a series of modern fables um, and storytelling for kids that is dealing with these new problems that kids are facing, the, the pressure to want to be Pinterest worthy or Instagram worthy. You know, that's not something I grew up with, but it is something they're facing now. Kids, I see my nephews, um, I have two nephews that are uh, deeply on the autism spectrum. And seeing how other kids are taught and are fully capable to be like, oh, we introduce them as autistic. And these kids are like, okay, cool. And they adjust their behavior and know how to deal with it. I was like, these kids are blowing my mind. They're so amazing. And I want to make stories and things that help them navigate through life and lift them up um, while they're dealing with a more complicated world than I was. Um, and not talking down to them about it. So that's something I'm personally very passionate about. And when I, the stuff that I write, the stuff that I'm hoping to direct in um, more TV format is definitely down that path. Um, we, as we look for, uh, you know, Chris is always looking with me for more talent and things. Um, for me, the dividing line as a studio, as, and you know, as a head of a studio, I'm like, there's always gonna be people who wanna do stop motion that's like Halloween. Right, I have the stop motion and Halloween have a huge relationship. Stop motion and Christmas have a huge relationship. Um, but someone that wants to make a horror film or someone that wants to make, you know, something could be artistic, it could be interesting. I could love it, but I'm not gonna help them make it because there's enough people in the world to help them make it. Like I really want like people with a passionate voice to tell stories we haven't heard before, to tell stories that make the world a better place for having been told. And that's really what I'm looking for, and that's really what I'm passionate about finding and being a part of. Um, so if we're going to put in that much work and blood, sweat, tears to like make something uh, created out of thin air, guys, that's what's so amazing about animation. We out of nothing and we build a whole world. Um, I'm really passionate about building worlds that make the world a better place for having existed. Um, so I don't need another end of the world. <laughs> I watched a movie the other night and every single trailer was like another, the world is going to end and this is why or how. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, 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 that's nice. Someone else will help you make that story. Um, but I really think that we do, we lift each other up. We give each other um, the empowerment to take up space in this world. And I don't think enough that you can't, you have to tell that story again and again and again that take up space in the world. You deserve to take up space in the world. You deserve to take up space in the room. You deserve to be a part of the conversation. And I think we just really 
you can't say it enough times. It's not like we made one movie and now, yeah, good, that story's out there. I want uh, to show that again and again and again, that you deserve to take up space. Um, and and that, that should be a good place to live from. Um, so that's for me, that's what I'm really passionate about. Um, we're exploring lots of different stories um, I think by nature of animation, we like world building, you know, so we do really appreciate stories coming our way that, you know, visually are interesting and, you know, design wise, those things are validly important in animation. Um, and that's what's so exciting. In animation, I can have a bigger idea, but in live action, it would be so expensive. <laughs> like, it's like, well, I don't have Game of Thrones money, but I could do an animation. We could do crazy costume design and crazy, you know, set design because we get to build it from nothing, so. I love that. <laughs> and I that's love that why so I love working much. with you too. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, to piggyback off of that is that like, um, I feel, and I think that this is why we work so well together is that like, I feel really passionately about supporting people who want to tell important stories. And I want to make, I want to help people tell their stories and I want to create an environment that is safe for people and as low waste as possible. And um, a big part of that is the research that goes into the materials that are used, the safety procedures required and making sure that enough time is budgeted for the project that we're not churning and burning through supplies. We can use reusable supplies because we have the budget for someone who helps clean up the studio and we have budgeted enough time for the the schedule to not be, you know, eating us alive. And so the, it's it's like these two things that we, you know, have to balance as a small studio is that like how do we tell these beautiful stories that really mean a lot to us and how do we do them in an ethical way that makes us feel good about the space that we're taking up that we're taking good care of the people who work for us and that in a in a industry um stop motion makes a lot of waste a lot of waste and frankly a significant amount of it is slightly toxic or just flat out toxic. So like, how can we try to change, um, you know, change and pivot so that we can tell amazing stories, take good care of the people who make them and feel good about the footprint that we're leaving behind. I wanna piggyback on Chris's piggyback. This is, see, shoulder height, we just keep picking, yeah, I know. Um, that's cheesy, but uh, Chris is, journey let her really hone in on what she's passionate about like what jobs best fit her because of what she loves what gives her energy what inspires her and that's something that when you're early in your career and you're still in school and you're still doing these things and you're trying to figure out like you're like I really everybody wants to be an animator why because that's the name of the job like we're in animation right we want to be animators but you might discover that you like being a texturer. you might discover that you like being a modeler you might discover that you like you know particle effects or you know other things and there's so many jobs within jobs and jo like the field is like, I wanna be in sound. Then you find out there's like 25 different jobs within that field. So constantly figuring out again, who are you is gonna be a part of the journey of saying like everybody in live action, everybody wanted to be a director. I was embarrassed to admit I wanted to be a director because everybody wanted to be a director. And it took me 10 years of analyzing and deciding that's what I wanted to do. And so I think, um, finding out what you want to do and how you can best support it. I think people don't look in production nearly enough. Being an animation producer is an incredibly creative job. It's not making physical or like visual art, but you're still problem solving all the time. And maybe that's your side of creativity. Maybe problem solving is a good place for you, or maybe you really like making personal art and then have want to be involved in the industry. You know, there's lots of spaces. So I think um, that's something else to just keep your hearts open to the very wide range of jobs available within the industry 
And you don't just want to be an animator because it's like the easiest word. I'm an animation. What do you do? I'm an animator, right? Like there's lots of things within that. And we hire animators very specifically. Are you an expression nuanced animator? Are you a physicality animator? You know, like what is your niche within that? And you'll be hired again and again because you're really good at one specific piece of it, not every piece of it. Um, so I think, again, finding out uh, what you really want to do and specializing. Specializing is a very good way to continue to move forward. Um, yeah, um, thank you so much. This is such an amazing um, panel, I think. And um, there's everybody in the chat is like going crazy. Um, we are, however, reaching one hour mark. So we're slowly wrapping this up and taking a few less questions. Um, and Melissa is asking, um, one of my long-term goals is to start a virtual animation production studio, much like the one that you have someday. Uh, what advice would you give to those with career girls like that? So if you want to start your own studio, um, you want to learn about being a producer. Um, because really at this point in my career, yes, I'm also a director. Yes, I do creative things and I love them and I'm passionate about them, but I'm passionate about letting my artist make the art. I am a business person. I am a business owner and the producing, the budget, the scheduling, the hiring, the firing, that is what it is to own a studio. It is not for everybody, but it is amazing. And it is going to be a real part of us getting these new voices out, us getting women as directors. Come on, people. There are so few female directors in animation. It is a crime. And so we do want, we do want, and I wanna encourage you guys to start studios and I want, but it is not for everybody. You really wanna focus on business. You wanna focus on scheduling, how to break down a budget. Those are the things that are gonna matter because it is the budgets that are gonna allow you to give the staff, that is gonna allow you to make the projects. Um, and really, really, if you wanna own and run a studio, um, it's more accessible than ever. Amazon Nimble Studio, go for it. Make things, be brilliant, make the world amazing. But there is a very real side of that. Look at business, read books on business. It is, that is, that is what you're doing. Once you're the head of a studio, that's what you're doing is running a business, um, which I love. And I will talk to you about it. If you wanna do it, email me. We will share our contact and let you guys connect with us um, and find us on all the social platforms and things. We're just building up a new social platform for Shoulder Height Films um, that we're excited about developing and growing um, as a way that you can connect with us. Um, but that's what I would say. If you wanna open a studio, talk to people that are running small businesses um, so that's what I would say. Oh, thank you. And then one last question is, so as an introvert, how do you deal with um, burnout? Burnout. We focus a lot as creatives. We give energy all the time, right? We put energy into our projects. We put energy out, 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 out. And we rarely think about what gives us energy back. So there's, of course, everybody like, shuts down, takes a few days off, hides away. Yeah, classic examples, but I find that's a really slow way to build my energy back up when I'm burnt out. And I think the best thing that I've discovered, and it's different for everybody, but no matter how busy you are, no matter what's going on, set aside some amount of bandwidth for your own personal project. Have a personal art project for me, it might just be embroidering at night, you know, like I'm making my mom a Christmas present and I'm embroidering. Right now, I'm actually, I have a personal stop motion film that um, I've been building for years prior to even building a studio and I keep working on it, despite the fact that someday my team will work on it, we'll do these things. Like I just keep plugging away and um, having a personal project, it doesn't matter who loves it, who you share it with, it's just for you as an artist gives energy back into my own creative life instead of giving it all away professionally, giving it all away to everybody else around me. So for me, I not just take the time off and hide away, but I work on a personal art project. Um, and that I, speeds up the burnout recovery for me. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, yeah, because personal projects, they bring joy too, and it gives you more energy to, to kind of go back at all that other um, yeah. 
mess. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, do you have any last remarks, any last things you would like to say uh, to the audience? Um, I will, I, they're going to be sending out an email so you guys can connect with us, but we're at shoulder height films on Instagram. I only have four posts out there. So, um, but I do manage the messaging. Um, so if you guys want to write to me through that platform, it's a fast way for me to connect to you on a visual platform where I can see your work. And it's, you know, it kind of, it's like putting a face to the name, you know, in a way, like I see your artwork and I'm like, oh, that's that person. Right. And I, you know, can see and follow your work. Um, so it's a good place to reach out we'll offer more and connect with us on linkedin and you know all the all the places but um i do i do personally uh take care of all of those direct message you know and commenting and stuff so um reach out guys say hello let's let's have a conversation so yeah chris do you have anything else um just you know keep hustling man just keep working whether it's your work, whether it's work for other people, whether it's just connecting with people. Um, and when you need to take a break, you take a break, you know, just listen to listen to whatever is the clock or, or, you know, the small voice that's inside of you, you know, whatever it is, just follow that, follow that, you know, for me, it's follow the dopamine, what is getting me excited, I'm doing that. And so whatever that means for you, do that. Um, and, you know, it just is continuing to do the work and taking good care of yourself so that you can do the work. Yeah. And good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much. I just went ahead and put the Instagram for those who want it in the chat. Um, so feel free to follow. Awesome. Um, I wanted to thank you all so much for joining. Oh, you just went to mute. <laughs> Whoopsie. Um, I was saying, and for the great advice, everyone has been raving um, in the chat, just that this has been an amazing talk, really wholesome and real is what everyone <laughs> needed to hear. <clears throat> so thank you. Good. I mean, that's what we're here for, guys. Like, that's why we take the time for these kind of panels. Like, we get it we're, you know, we're in the same grind as you, we're in the same hustle. And, you know, we, I've just been doing it longer. That's all. Just keep going. Yeah, it just, it really is just that same grind that we're talking about. It just, it just, it doesn't really get easier. You just get better at it. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's just practicing. It's a muscle. You just keep and going. As you keep networking, those relationships go from being a network to friends, to colleagues, to people, you know, people that you have shared experiences with, and it just makes it easier. It's not that I'm better at networking. I just have longer relationships with all the people I have been networking with. Um, and so you guys keep it up, but make them into relationships. And that also takes a lot of the burden off of it being networking. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. and pe people aren't, they aren't um competition they're collaborators right so like don't judge yourself based off of other people don't um just don't like other people are they're not your competitors they're your collaborators yeah. you know yeah awesome well That's thanks so much for having us it was yeah. so lovely to chat at you guys it's a pleasure to having y'all thank you thank so all right. We'll close awesome. slowly out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye.